Hi there. My name is Angelo John Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network. What follows is an online community exploration or practicum on the subject of writing as a spiritual gateway, hosted by renowned poet Diana Gesh for the Sacred Inclusion Network on November 21st, 2020. In the video, I'll give a proper introduction to Diana, but I'd like to start with a couple of quotes, one from Diana herself and the other from Thomas Merton. Let's start with Thomas Merton, who writes, learn how to meditate on paper. Drawing and writing are forms of meditation. Diana writes, in my writing and also in my teaching, I see no essential difference between the spiritual path and the artistic path. For one thing, both are lifelong practices of letting go of ego, if only temporarily. So without further ado, here's Deanna. And I am about to introduce Deanna. I won't try to say her last name. I'll say a little bit about her. Um, she's uh, quite an accomplished uh, poet and writer. She has completed eight chapbooks, I believe, some of whom have won uh, major awards. Uh, she's also a National Endowment for the Arts Fellow and she also teaches, and she's many years at, at the Iowa, Iowa, what is it, the Iowa Writing something or other, which is probably the most prestigious of uh, writing teaching things in the country. And uh, we're just delighted to have her. I'm delighted to have her. She's a lot of fun, and uh, I guess you'll, you'll be the judge of that. But, uh, uh, do we start now? Yes, we can start now. You're on. <laughs> okay. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Angelo. Yeah, I've been um, lately teaching online every Thursday since the beginning of the pandemic. And um, we just write together. And the first time uh, I did this, we had 80 people show up from all over the world, just like this group, people from South America, people from Mongolia, I mean, Africa, uh, England. We had a gondolier from Venice show up. And we just wrote together, you know, in the middle of the pandemic. And um, with that group, I don't overtly talk about the spiritual aspect of writing, but um, you don't have to. You know, as they say, there's a lot of gates to the city. And, um, you know, you can just talk about things in terms of art and people will still um, have an opportunity to open up and, um, uh, you know, tune in, like Angela was saying, get attuned to who they are, what they are, what's going on with them. And, you know, writing is just one of these great ways of externalizing what's going on inside. But that's what good meditation does. You know, it's shamatha vipassana, right? You settle and then there's a gap and something comes through and, you know, it's like, whoa, that's what's going on with me. Um, so as a meditator, I've noticed that every time I've sat down with a big problem and I, you know, you take it to the cushion and you meditate, I don't always get the answer. Usually what I get is a different problem. You know, the meditation tells me, no, no, sweetie, your problem is over here, not there. <laughs> and then I can, you know, maybe get up and be more useful in, in general. Um, you know, but very much the same with writing. You know, you, you look at a blank page. It's very much like the space of meditation and whether you're an expert writer or not, and you've got this blank page in front of you and uh, anything can happen. And, you know, two of the things that can happen is you can either shut down the space, which is what a lot of people do when they meditate or they try to raise their children or they try to deal with conflict. They shut down the space. They, they default into uh, some kind of stinky, tired ego habit, or they can open up the space and permit themselves to be surprised and, uh, and kind of go with whatever situation. Um, and again, you, know, you don't have to talk about spirituality to work with people this way, uh, you know, with writing, but you could also do it the other way. You can, you can actually talk about meditation and art at the same time again, without having to be, you know, some kind of meditation master or some kind of virtuoso artist, you could still experience the same kind of um, openness, attunement, 
and frankly surprise you know that allows you to trust reality you know i don't trust reality until something shocking happens um because that's how reality communicates so often is through telling, telling you you know that's not it you're wrong you know here's what it is here's what it might be so uh so angelo asked me to come on and just share with you some writing practices but with the view of uh spirituality and and how how we could connect with that Someone has a barking dog, and I'd like them not to I, mute the not I to do. mute the dog, but to mute themselves. Can you mute I will. yourself, please? Yes, I will. Okay, thank you. I love dogs. <laughs> I hear a barking dog. I get jealous because I don't have one. Um, does everybody have a notebook? And if you don't, let me give you a second. Go ahead and get a notebook. I'd like to write by hand. Uh, today and if you want we can talk about why but I won't belabor it I'd like people not to type but actually to write by hand so I have this ancient thing that we visit in the Smithsonian called a pen please get a pen also so it's physical um, we use our hands and our notebooks and um, so if you're up for it what I'd like to do is just begin by showing you a document that I call the Rosetta Stone of free writing. Um, you know, if you're just looking to fill a blank page and dance on paper and see what the hell's going on, what would happen on this page, uh, I think the best document you could begin with is, is this one. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And what I'll do is I'll read this document. It's not very long, you'll see. And, and then I want, I want to hear from you. I, I'd like to hear what stays with you from this. So I'm going to share my screen here. And so does everybody see this? We can see this okay. And if you'd like, you can go ahead and take a screen capture if, if you want, just to have it for yourself, um, if you know how to do that. Um, <clears throat> so what we have here is an introduction to a collection of William Stafford. When William Stafford, the poet, died, um, his friend Robert Bly, uh, collected some of his works. Actually, a lot of people made their own collections of William Stafford's works posthumously. Uh, time has been very good to William Stafford. And then Robert Bly, the poet, wrote this introduction. And it's this introduction of Robert Bly talking about William Stafford's practice that uh, I think is, is quite valuable. So I'm going to read it, and I'd like for you to just bookmark in your head or jot down any particular moments that stay with you, that you think are worth uh, remembering, uh, shocking, maybe it's disagreeable, but anything that stays with you and worth talking about. William Stafford and the Golden Thread. One of Stafford's most amazing gifts to poetry is his theme of the Golden Thread. He believes that whenever you set a detail down in language, it becomes the end of a thread and every detail, the sound of the lawnmower, the memory of your father's hands, a crack you once heard in lake ice, the jogger hurtling herself past your window will lead you to amazing riches. William Blake said, I give you the end of a golden string, only wind it into a ball. It will lead you in at heaven's gate, built in Jerusalem's wall. I asked Stafford one day, do you believe that every golden thread will lead us through Jerusalem's wall, or do you love particular threads? He replied, no, every thread. He said, any impulse, any little impulse is accepted and enhanced. The stance to take, reading or writing, is neutral, ready, susceptible to now. Only the golden string knows where it is going, and the role for a writer or reader is one of following, not imposing. Stafford remarked, however, that purposeful writers may pull too hard. One has to be careful not to break the thread. So I'd like to just open this up and uh, maybe I'll leave the document up and we can just chime in. Somebody tell me something that stays with you, uh, something you might've marked or or jotted down or just bookmarked in your head. Uh, Linda, what stays with you? Um, it just reminded me of a spiritual retreat I was on in Scotland a couple of years ago. 
where we um, use the concept of a thread to um, do a very deep meditation. And it just took me back to that wonderful place. Um, a, um, okay. any, a, any particular mention of the thread on this page? Uh, he mentions it a few times. Is there one place in particular that... Uh... I think it's the golden string and not being careful not to break it. Okay. Don't break the that story. resonates for me because it, it relates to my writing. Um, okay. I, keep, I keep breaking the thread. So there's something here that sounds pretty precious, golden, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you, could, you could break it. You could break it or you could maintain it. So there's, um, there's possibility, but there's also failure in a sense. The thread doesn't fail. We fail. Fair to say? Yes. Uh, great, thank you. What, what else stays with someone? You can just chime in and just take us to one place in this passage that you bookmarked in your head or jotted down. I think for me, um, this is Tracy, for me, um, the role of following, um, not imposing, is pretty, is pretty amazing. Yeah. I think well, of why that. Did, go ahead. Think of that. Um, I think of that also, that's how I approach the, the artwork that I do. I, I know that it's, a, it's almost like a feeling of channeling rather than, you know, being a conduit, a hollow bone, rather than just actually uh, uh, maneuvering, <laughs> yeah. muscling, you know? Yeah. Who are you following? That's real. oh, that's lovely. Um, I think it, it's more like a, Actually, hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a feeling of divinity that is all encompassing. It's not just like a who, it's, a, it's an everything kind of thing, but it's cha particularly channeled with a fingerprint that I'm supposed to be offering through my body somehow, you know. So you're following a feeling of divinity. Yeah, yes. Okay. What it, what it means to me, you know. Yeah, well, there is this kind of mystical sense to the passage, isn't there? There's a sense of otherness. There's, there's me, and there's, there's this other thing going on. Now, of course, you're sitting alone writing, if you're William Stafford, but, or free writing, whatever he's doing. He's just sitting alone doing it, and yet he's got company. He's got this thread. There is a sense of otherness, that, a sense of not him, and yet... <laughs> it's also him, right? The thread is created by his pen or whatever, right? There's him and then there's not him or there's deeper him or wiser him or yes. a him he doesn't recognize somehow. Exactly, exactly. And it seems yeah. that pulling, not, not pulling, but like allowing for that conduit of information as it flows is a way to, um, deeper lineage, you know, uh, how we're all related mm -hmm. somehow. That's what it feels like to me. Uh, thank you. Anyone else, uh, someplace they could take us to that we haven't visited yet? Anything in this passage that stays with you? Okay, ready, susceptible to now. Uh, so for me, um, you know, it goes back to the question of ego. And so do I, am I totally in the now? Am I just totally present with it? Or am I bringing something uh, into the situation which is, you know, imposing uh, on the direction in which it's going to go? Uh, so that's, so I want to be clear about that, that I am truly uh, susceptible to now and ready and, and neutral in the sense that I'm not bringing my own ego needs into the situation and, uh, you know, imposing on it. Yeah. Yeah. So we got following, not imposing. Uh, so Bill, what about this word susceptible? That's a really interesting mm -hmm. word, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Susceptible to the now. Susceptible. That's a word for disease. Right, you, yeah, you that you're, you're susceptible to catching a cold. You're inclined, and well, I wonder, could you be inclined towards something too? Like maybe you're, you know, you mentioned before, like your deeper self, this otherness. 
okay, what is that? Isn't that a part of you? And maybe that is what makes you, you know, if you're, if you're attuned to that, then you are susceptible to the now. Yeah. Because it's yeah. within you to begin with, right? Yeah. Yeah, susceptible. I'm going to catch the flu of nowness. <laughs> um, in fact, it's going to be so bad that I can't even get rid of it. I'm going to be so sick with now. I'm going to be infected with uh, susceptibility to now. Um, yeah, I've actually used this as a, an entire semester's course, believe it or not. And we spend a month on neutral, a month on ready, and a month on susceptible to now, because they're three different things. There's a lot here going on. You know, neutral is, is the idea of, you know, letting go of agendas. You know, we write a page, you know, and you wouldn't believe the amount of agendas any ordinary person has when they write, starting with how they think, how they feel about themselves, uh, how they feel about their grammar, how they feel about their educational level, their lexicon, um, their profundity, or the opposite. You know, same deal in a sense, but the opposite, you know, how, how bad a writer they think they are, how, you know, whatever, they're not neutral. And that's just the self. And then there's all their attitudes about the subject. Um, it is amazing how people can write the same damn page, no matter what the subject is. It's a little like the way people dance at parties. It doesn't matter what the party is. It doesn't matter what the song is, how fast, how slow, there's that same guy doing the frat boy two-step, no matter what, could be punk, could be Brahms, doesn't matter, there's a frat boy two-step, it's the same dance. People do the dance they like to do when they fill up a page. What would it be like if they were neutral, ready, susceptible to now? What would it be like to write a page that was completely different every single page, just the way life is completely different and the weather is completely different every single day? You know, this is the kind of thing that's talked about in spirituality as well. You know, what would it be like if we just got rid of our limiting belief systems, our habitual patterns, and just opened up to every situation, you know, and saw it for what it was and not for what we are. Uh, anything else left uh, that we haven't talked about somebody, somebody wants to, to mention? Yeah, um, I'm just struck with this um, sort of, um, uh, he talks about purposeful writers. Um, often I'm a, purposeful, I'm a purposeful writer. I have something I want to say you know, and um, I recognize that, uh, and that's the reason I'm doing it, is because I'm trying to convey a particular thing. So uh, I get the whole idea of trying to let go of that, but at the same time, it doesn't feel totally realistic to me in terms of if, if, ha if I have an intent, how can I not be purposeful? How can I be totally neutral, ready, susceptible to now? Good. Well, you know, this is a great question. You have to start somewhere. And again, this is very same as a spiritual path. I mean, everybody enters through ego. Everybody enters the spiritual path through ego. Or as a Christian once told me, suffering is our way toward God in this world. But, you know, Buddhists would call the suffering ego, you know, some version of samsaric suffering. And we want to get clean. We want to get better. We want to, you know, whatever. Well, it's the same for entering the page. We enter with some agenda, some modicum, some crap, maybe a big fat plan. But I always tell students, you know, if you get what you planned from a piece of writing, put it aside. It is worthless. So even if, you know, Angelo, you wanted to write an op-ed, you knew exactly the subject, you knew exactly your stance, um, you still, somewhere on that page, better surprise yourself, um, even within the framework of what you do know, you're still looking for what you don't know. You're still looking for that golden thread of unknown where you can actually be smarter than yourself. Because again, if you get what you expect from a piece of writing, it's worthless. The way Robert Frost put it was no surprise for the writer, 
no surprise for the reader. You know, and again, you know, on the spiritual side, you know, great teachers uh, don't really plan their talks terribly well or terribly much. They might have a couple words on a card, but they want to see the space first. They want to sit, um, you know, take a seat, look at the room, speak for the space, um, e even if they wanted to talk about, you know, karma or the Holy Spirit or, you know, whatever it is they might want to talk about. They have to see what it's doing right now, you know, and I, I would say the same for anything. I, mean, I, I approach this all the time. I'm, I'm working on a memoir right now. I'm working on a revision right now, but I go into this kind of mode all the time. The reason why I need to revise is I probably lost the golden thread somewhere and I have to find it. And the way I know I found it is if there's a surprise. And that's, that's uh, the motto I give people you know, very, very simply, your goal is to surprise yourself on the page. You know, it comes right out from the golden string. Only the string knows where it's going. So it's the surprise that, that, that actually is the thing that we can trust most. And that simple goal, surprise myself on the page, is actually um, pretty complex because you can do it once, and that's a good day, but if you try to do the same thing the next day, it's the opposite of a surprise. It quickly becomes a formula. You know, now you're just chasing after a feeling. You know, and that happens in the arts all the time. People's ego is being mistaken for their voice. Well, it's not their voice. Um, it's just, you know, some, some style they're shutting down on um, be, because they, you know, they just get into a habit. It's really fearsome and brave to actually go to beginner's mind, open to a blank page, lose all the ideas about you being good and you being bad and just uh, surprise yourself. So one of the things I say to students as well as that, you know, the goal is to surprise yourself. I also remind them um, <clears throat> you need to give yourself permission to suck. You know, now, now Stafford in this passage uh, you know, we, we, we get this idea that everything's going to lead to Jerusalem's wall. I mean, you know, like it's all just going to be successful. There's a confidence here. Every detail, every single thing you put down, you can trust is the golden string. But there's another word, which is fine. It's very confident. There's another word that's important. And that's this word here. This word stance, if you can see. It's a stance that he's giving. The golden thread is a stance. You, you, you take a position like a good batter in baseball. You're ready for the curveball. You're ready for the off-speed pitch, the knuckleball, the fastball. You're ready for all these different locations. And you have a stance that's ready. Maybe you choke up a little on the bat if there's two outs or whatever. You take this stance. And that's what a writer does as well. That's also what a meditation practitioner does. It's called the inner posture. You take a stance, and part of that stance is physical, but part of it is also a letting go that you can see in the posture. Um, and so, you know, when we free write, we have to take a stance. The stance is neutral, ready, susceptible to now. We have to be willing to suck, which is also the permission to be brilliant. You know, it's really both. Um, so, uh, anybody up for an exercise? Shall we open to a clean sheet of paper? Um, now, the motto I give myself as a teacher is to exploit randomness. I never plan my assignments in advance, and I could prove that because um, Lena, who I have never met, is going to give me a page number. Uh, just any page number you want. I have three books in front of me. Just give me a page number, Lena. You have an inspiration? Number, number 54. Oh, well, that's a fantastic number. That's really wonderful. I was going to think a different one, but now that you've said 54, I can right away see this is a very advanced group. And um, someone else tell me which book we should look at. Book number one, number two, or number three. We'll make it really random. Uh, Amada. <laughs> we have fiction. We have short stories and we have nonfiction. What do, what do you want, Amada? Nonfiction. 
Nonfiction. Well, this happens to be the Diary of Anne Frank. We're going to look at page 54 from the Diary of Anne Frank, and I'm going to pick the first uh, interesting subject on page 54. And when I name this subject, we'll just use that as a starting point. Okay, you don't know what's gonna happen. You're just gonna write. So the only rule is that we write continuously without stopping. We don't worry about grammar. We don't, oh good, Bill's doing stretches. Wonderful, we're all ready. See, it's like a good baseball <laughs> back. <laughs> Neutral, susceptible. Um, and we're just gonna write. And then, uh, you know, don't even think Maybe it'll be surprising. Maybe something new will come in. You'll go with that. You just write freely. And um, after a few minutes, you'll hear this, which means just find the period. Um, and I'm going to interrupt your masterpiece. And then we'll just see what we have. And we'll see if we've surprised ourselves. So OK, so I'm back to page 54. I'm also going to turn my, uh, my video off as we write. But but I'll leave the sound on so you'll have a feeling of privacy. You might want to turn your video off as you write as well. Um, okay, 54. So what subject we're going to have? I see the word misery. So there you go. Start with the word or the idea of misery and then just uh, write like mad and uh, you'll hear this gong in a little bit. Good luck or bad luck.
So there's a wonderful sound of someone's pen scratching. It might be the one who's calling in. I'm not sure, but it's really quite compelling. Um, anyhow, so we have this page that we've scribbled. And uh, what are we gonna do now? What I'd like you to do is um, check out the end of the page and just, just look where you wound up, maybe the last sentence or two. Just look it over and, you know, compare it to the beginning, you know, would you have expected to get wherever it is you got? And that's always a healthy sign. Um, if you ended in a place that you did not expect, it means you took a journey. It means that perhaps you surprised yourself, you know, somehow. It's actually pretty straightforward that way. And then what I'd like you to do is, is read this back to yourself and just make a mark somewhere where there was a moment that actually was particularly fresh or surprising. Like, wow, okay, I didn't expect that. Sometimes we don't notice that actually till we read back to ourselves. So why don't you take a minute and just read it back and just mark what you think might have been surprising if there was something, it does, there doesn't have to be. And now what I'd like to do is just invite uh, maybe a few of us to, to read out what we have. Nobody should feel forced to read ever, because if you knew that was coming, you'd never write again. And I want to do some more writing. But uh, w would there be someone who would like to read? Just, just hear your voice reading. Uh, there's no disclaimer, because we all just scribbled this thing. You could say, here's this thing. That could be your disclaimer. Uh, anyone feel like reading? I'll okay, read. I'll do it. Okay. Right, so we'll go with Linda and then Bill. Uh, Linda. Okay. How to avoid misery at all costs. Think of all the people suffering in the world without hope, living in despair. It's not fair. Why can't there be an answer to the misery and despair? Misery is visceral, deeply embedded, hard to shake off. Yet there are people who can do it. They find a way. What's the difference between those who find a way and those who don't? Living in misery is not living, it's death. Resilience is the antidote to misery. I've personally experienced both, being stuck in misery and being resilient. It's a mystery how that process unfolds. Going from misery to resilience, there's something comforting about knowing this transition is possible. Can you read the what's the difference sentence again? Just that one. Um, if I can find it. It's about halfway through. What is the difference between those who find a way and those who don't? I'd make a check mark next to that. Okay. That has a freshness to it. I could see that as a beginning. Often we get things that have beginning energy. You know, that feeling of just, okay, that sounds like a beginning of something. 
without even knowing too much conceptually. I'm not even thinking conceptually at this point. I'm just sensing there's something fresh happened with that line. Um, which one did you check as a surprise? Did you mark anything there as a surprise? Um, I started to mark that, but then I went down to the next sentence. Go ahead. Resil Resilience is the antidote to misery. Resilience is the antidote to misery. Okay. Okay. Let's hear from Bill. Let's, uh, I'd like to hear a few of these. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Bill, would you like to read for us? Okay. Um, misery loves company, but why not do something more noble, no, no, more blessed, by not hoping that someone goes down with me, but rather that I get myself out of it by accepting it, living with it, not being against it, not infecting anyone, uh, anyone else uh, with this temporarily diseased particle that's uh, coming from me. No getting someone else down in the hole that I'm in. Oh, I've assumed that I am the miserable person. How interesting. Why? Am I that person really right now? No, I'm happy because I just came up with such a clever idea. But now I'm starting to get miserable because my ego, pride, and desire to look good have appeared. Well, what did you mark, Bill, as surprising um, to you? I have, a, when I realized, I have assumed that I am that miserable person. How interesting. Yeah, read that sentence for us verbatim, can you? I have assumed that I am the miserable person. How interesting, why? Am I that yeah. person really right now? Yeah. Um, so what we start to notice, you know, when I free write with people is that there are certain kinds of um, ways of relating to a subject. And one of the things I, I work with is what I call tight tether and loose tether. Some people, when they get a subject, um, they just stay on it. Uh, they, in, in meditation, they call this close placement. When you stay close to an object, object of meditation, and, uh, you know, sometimes people just uh, write something that could be like an encyclopedia entry of here, uh, here's the anatomy of misery. Now, other people have a, a more of a loose tether when they go after a subject. The, the misery turns to other things and they jump around and there's associative leaps. I don't want anyone to think there's a good or bad or a right or wrong to this. I just want you to start to notice what are some of your default patterns, you know, as, as a writer. And if you find you have a very loose tether, you know, dreamlike, um, leaping, fragmentary, things like that, try tightening it just to try another kind of note to play. Conversely, if you have a, uh, a tight tether, you know, you go into like some narrative memory every time and you stay in that narrative moment, uh, try loosening it up. You know, if you tend to ruminate and cycle around one thing when you write, um, fine, that's great. That could be appropriate for some things, but just as an exercise, try to loosen it up. Try to see where this can um, leap to. And as people start to practice uh, free writing, they start to notice that we don't just have a stream of consciousness. What we have is more like an eight lane highway we've got choices. Maybe you've seen this already that you could write continuously and still be aware of a pile up of options happening in your mind, even, if, even as you're writing the next word. That's one of the reasons why it's good to handwrite because it's a little slower than typing for most people, which gives you time to physically be continuous when you write and also choose different lanes of the highway. You could choose mindfully a very safe lane and still write continuously and call it free writing. Or you could, or you could shift into a, a riskier lane. Um, you could shift into a tighter tether, a looser tether. Um, you can go into voices, you can go into dialogue. And again, none of these is right or wrong, but it's, it's really good to be aware. And then to be able to mindfully shift lanes while you're writing continuously. So this is just some of the things that I start to notice and start to point out, you know, as people just read. And again, all of these things are in service of that, that holy grail of surprising ourselves. You know, what did we not know 
that just comes up on the page, you know, this other, this muse, this unconscious, this universal, you know, whatever you want to call this thing, kind of doesn't matter what you call it. It's a surprise. Um, would, would anyone else like to, to read? Just, just read out there free read. Amato, would you like to read? Yeah, I'm all over the place. Just letting you know. <laughs> oh, so now I've already said your disclaimer can only be, here's this thing I wrote. <laughs> Okay, here's this thing I wrote. Um, so, affliction comes and go. He knows too well of ours, others, physical affliction. But what about the afflictions of the soul? The misery we encounter when we neglect our soul. Through our mind action, by bringing misery to our spirit. We slash I are stingy with oneself slash myself by not giving the self the nourishment it needs. Mm. And what did you mark as surprising to you? Well, I was, I was going back and forth with the we and the I and the yeah. self. Yeah. So um, to me, it was through our slash my actions by bringing misery to our spirit. So I noticed when I chose this word that I chose an abstract noun. Now, just, just in, in writing 101, abstract nouns get us in trouble. You know, uh, so an abstract noun is something that you cannot see walking down a street. Now you could see somebody struggling with crutches walking down a street. Uh, that's concrete, crutches or limping or, you know, these kinds of things, you know, a limp is a concrete thing. You can see it. Um, misery is an abstract noun and abstract nouns can lead to abstract writing that's harder for others to see. So if I had said something more like, um, you know, uh, you know, hubcap or, you know, whatever, any concrete noun, it, it has a different effect on us, you know. Um, so for a spiritual group, if I had to do that assignment again, I would choose something more along the lines of, you know, dead dog, <laughs> something you could smell <laughs> rather than misery or truth or, or something like that. Uh, I'd like to read you what I had. Um, this is just my free write. <clears throat> Sweet misery, someone will say when they've fallen in love. Maybe they're bragging. Maybe they are humble. Maybe they have smelled the flowers and now the flowers are rotting. Maybe it will feel like one of their thigh bones is being sawed off. I don't know a word worse than amputation. I see some people after their amputations and I don't know how they are alive. Medically, I realize they survived it, something about a tourniquet or the amputation was what kept them alive. I once heard about a boy begging for his hands to be amputated. They were not useful hands and had given him enormous pain since birth. The doctors couldn't understand it. He begged and begged for them to be amputated until they cut off one of them and he was relieved. So, you know, the pattern here is what often happens in a free write. You have this initiating subject and you do some dog paddling for a while. But what I would put a star next to in terms of where I surprise myself is I don't know a word worse than amputation, you know, and something switched and there was fresh air and, um, and after that, you know, that's what interests me. If I were to, to stay with this, I'd start with the amputation, not with, not with this initiating word misery. And again, often that's what happens in a free write. The deepest part of it is never how you begin. It's usually down the page. Uh, it's, it's really pretty simple when you think about it. When you have a conversation um, with your friend, you know, usually we begin in a very shallow way. Angelo began by saying, hi, everyone, welcome. And, you know, none of these things is profound. 
they're polite, they're proper. Hi, how are you? And then suddenly um, you say, that's a nice necklace. And, and then they say, yeah, when my mom died, this is what I found. And now I wear it every day. And suddenly you're in this very deep conversation, you know, and that's the way things go. That's also the way things go often on the page. It's, it's, you don't usually get your true beginning of something until pretty far down, maybe even toward the end of what you're writing, you, you stumble on something. A uh, very similar thing goes on uh, for people who are therapists. You know, they call it these doorknob moments, right? The patient is about to leave and they say, oh yeah, one last thing. And then it's like, breaks the game open. It's the most profound thing there is. Often it goes that way. I've seen this also on spiritual retreats. They say, if you go on a solo retreat, stay the whole time. If you say, if you determine to do a five day retreat, stay the whole time. You know, maybe after four days, it's not working or whatever working is supposed to be, but stay that fifth day. You'd be surprised how often it's, it's you know, toward the end that wherever this happens. I and mean, ultimately it's random, but you're looking for that surprise. And for me, I did not expect to be talking about amputation, <laughs> even with the beginning of misery. Um, now, the other thing that we need to be able to do is turn the page and not worry whether it goes good or whether it goes badly, or if we're bored or if we're excited, just turn the page. So uh, would you like to do another free write? Sure. Okay, so, um, so one exercise is to, is to get a random subject. There's another exercise I'd like to do where we take a first line where I give you a phrase or a beginning of a sentence and we just all start with the same uh, jump off and then we just go wherever we go with the first line. So um, perhaps Jim can give us a page number and I'll find the first interesting first line on whatever page that is. Would you like to give us a page number, Jim? 31. Oh, you know, that's an outstanding number. Um, I just want... I want to note that for the record. Okay, page 31. Um, and I'm taking this from a, a novel by my friend called Songs from a Voice. He's usually dependable for a good first line because he's, he's trained as a poet. So poets usually care about how they begin sentences. Um, all right, so I'm going to read the first interesting sentence and, and we'll get a phrase on page 31. Give me a second, please. Okay, you ready? So please turn to a clean sheet of paper. It's gonna be the same rule. Um, we're gonna write continuously, not worrying about anything. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we'll begin with this line. We were raised. To be proud. Of. And that's it. We were raised to be proud of, and then you're just going to write. Okay. Just go ahead. Good luck. I'm going to turn off my, my video and my sound, and then I'll turn it back on and I'll, I'll play the gong in a while. So
Anybody feeling a little exhaustion? <laughs> Is this tiring for anyone? Linda, a little exhausted perhaps? Yeah, I feel um, a little drained about what's coming up. Oh, the, the, the topics and the subject matter, you think? Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things I tell people in, you know, in my Thursday night uh, writing sessions is uh, I, I have these reminders that we have every week. You know, one of them is always, you know, you're allowed to suck. It's fine. The teachings still go in. Another reminder is that what we're doing here is training, not learning. Now we're learning. I mean, I'm teaching, I'm maybe introducing, you know, some model or some example or some concept and, you know, we're learning, I guess. People take notes, but none of that learning can possibly go in unless we're training. You know, when a writer trains, they're actually building muscles and they're building stamina and people have reported to me that, you know, when they do these exercises, you know, five weeks later, there's more stamina. There's more of a feeling of just being able to stay with something going down the page. Uh, and, you know, the brain when we write is a muscle. And it's, it's very similar with uh, meditation practitioners. Um, you know, the nervous system does evolve and change when we meditate, it changes our nervous system. And so you have, you know, experienced practitioners being able to hang in there, you know, and sit much, much longer and go on retreat for much, much longer. Um, whereas other people, you know, you start off at seven minutes, that's enough, people it's torture, whatever. And very similar in, in the writer's path, you know, to be able to just sort of build stamina, you know, and, and once that starts to happen, then there is learning, then actually, you can actually put to use some of the things you're hearing. But there's really no shortcut, you know, you can hear the most wise thought about writing someone 100 times wiser than I could ever be. But it's not going to take root, you know, unless there's that training element. Um, and we see this often, again, in exhaustion, and, and, you know, the stamina. Um, would anyone like to, to read this? Did you surprise yourself with this piece of writing? We began with, we were raised to be proud of, and uh, maybe Jim can read for us. We were raised to be proud of our intelligence. I heard, you're smart, Jimmy, you should be a lawyer. Ah, the aspirations of the educated children of immigrants. I used to say under that pressure, I want to be a bum. Since I'm here today, which path do you think I took? Yeah, a bum, a hippie. Though I saw myself as a spiritual seeker, my life from the outside looked directionless, unproductive. Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, bum again. Hallelujah, give me a handout. I'm on the road again. My lover and I repeated this over and over, jumping up and down during a break at a Buddhist meditation retreat. Yeah. And there's lots of gateways in this piece, lots of points of entry. You know, the obvious one is toward the end, hallelujah, I'm a bum. And we have this meditation retreat, but then there's also that kid saying, I wanna be a bum. That'd be interesting, you know, if you wanted to pursue that. I mean, I mean, if you didn't fast forward, there's nothing wrong in this free right. There's nothing wrong in any free right. But if you were to go back and stay with that, a kid telling his immigrant parents, uh, excuse me, I want to be a bum. <laughs> I mean, what would that dinner table be like if you stayed there for a while? You know, and, and it's something that could be interesting, you know, as a piece of writing. Um, did, did you want to say something, Jim? <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, I think that's a good insight. Uh, writing that down brought up memories of my childhood, yeah. of the sense of pressure. Yeah. And I think you also benefited from this elusive tether, perhaps, uh, this, this freedom to say, okay, I've got the, the kid voice, but now I've got this song happening. And now I've got this Buddhist retreat I'm going to kind of shade into. 
and there's a, there's a freedom there. Let's just try all kinds of things. You know, that, that's that sense of journey, that sense of, okay, let's just, I call it knocking on the door. Yeah. You know, the door always opens from the other side, but we've got to knock. And we've got to find different ways to come down the page. So someone probably needs to mute <laughs> because they're getting a delivery. <laughs> all very interesting. <laughs> Would anyone else like to read out loud? Bits, but it's, now it's dry. Okay, yeah. Um, the glass is still going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Lena's getting a delivery in Germany. For me, it was not really convenient to go. And she, she's away from her computer, so she doesn't know. No, 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 it's not so interesting. Yeah. Just, can I just sort of sit? <laughs> Hi, Lena. Could you mute yourself, please? <laughs> Are you there, Lena? <laughs> uh, who else would like to read out loud? I would like to go. Okay. Is this Alyssa? Okay. Um, you were raised to be proud of being human. Superior to all other creatures on the face of the planet. Superior and separate. Separation. Separation. Is there a stop in that word? Is it distinguish? Is it distinctive? Here we are now waiting for the golden thread to appear. Waiting for an epiphany to come. Waiting for the moment that has always been there, that is and will be. Yet always close, ever changing. Lasting, perishing, human paradox of life. Samsara, fluidity of my tongue, on my tongue, like sand on the ocean. Tiny particles moved by the force of the wave, the water, the endless power of the universe. Distract to hide, to veal or unveil the patterns of eternal reality. Beginning to end, starting anew, here we are looking at the opening. The senses alert, the body tense, aligned, but unaware, asleep. Until a tingling, until a rapture, until something cracks, that the light makes us start wondering, who am I, what am I, why am I here? What are we really? So this is, this is, uh, you know, when people talk about their voice um, or their self, you know, as a writer, I say, which one? And there, there, there are three um, big categories of self. Um, could you mute yourself, please, Linda? There's three big categories of self. There's the personal, there's the interpersonal, and there's the cosmic. And we can think of writers of, of, of each of these three. We can think of personal writers, especially contemporary people personal poets, confessional writers, uh, memoir writers. These are personal writers. Their, um, their content is quite intimate, very specific. There's a lot of place names. There's a lot of proper names. There's a lot of people's names. You know, this is our family name. This is the street where we grew up. Very personal, that writing. Then there's interpersonal. These are people who speak for a community. Um, people who tend to make speeches, people who are bards, who write poems that people can read at a funeral or a birthday. Um, you know, Whitman was a great interpersonal poet. He loved crowds. He loved talking to the future. It's very interpersonal, very much about people. Then the third category of the self is the cosmic. That's you, Alyssa. So in the cosmic uh, self, you don't have proper nouns. You don't have names. You don't have many concrete nouns, in fact. Uh, there are big concepts happening. There's uh, some kind of solar wind blowing across the page. <laughs> it's, um, it's very cosmic. Uh, often the cosmic writers are quite interested in nature. Um, Barry Lopez is a great example of a cosmic uh, writer. And again, this is something we can be mindful of when we free write. There's nothing right or wrong about any, about any page you free write because it's a free write. But you could try to say, okay, the next page will be personal. 
or interpersonal. I'll be speaking to a group. I'll be speaking for a group. Um, but, but can you relate to why I would say that this is cosmic writing, Alyssa? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's all I'm doing is describing what, what goes on. And again, this is some of the things that we get to try out when we, um, when we open up to writing and free writing is we start to become mindful of our thing, our default, which is fine. It's okay in and of itself, but there are times it could be more appropriate to be in another self, you know, and another space and not doing always the dance we're used to doing. You know, so the cosmic person probably uh, needs to train at getting more concrete. And then the concrete person, vice versa, needs to um, do a little work on, you know, maybe some deeper pattern going on or, you know, something like that. Um, you know, one rule I have is, is you know, you, you're not allowed to use a word like soul until very quickly you describe the sound it makes when you try to suck it out of a jar. <laughs> you know, or something very concrete. You know, you, you got soul. Okay, now how about peanut butter? <laughs> Let's put those two together. You know, again, this is just another way of, of training ourselves to, uh, to knock on the door, to be surprising, to make shifts, and, and to invite ourselves to see things as an eight-lane highway. Um, uh, who else would like to read for us? Maybe we'll have a couple more. If, if no one reads, I'll read again. <laughs> Unless you want to read, Angelo. Uh, yeah, I'll read. My, my difficulty, to be honest with you, is I can never read my handwriting, but uh, I will try. Uh, uh, we were raised to be proud of our tennis prowess. My dad, every Saturday morning, would wake me up and we would go to the tennis club. It was a black club, the only one in America, I was told. And I would, and I would, and I would be there, and marvel at the at the clay, the red clay, freshly laid out clay, um, that that was there, and, my, and I would stretch my boyhood body before playing. And I can't read what it says. Be I would be in these days. Uh, with with my dad, and in the time I would, I would make sure I would, I would, I would, I would. Uh, anyhow, my aspiration was to beat him at tennis, and in much the same way that I had uh, learned how to beat him at chess uh, many years before. And then I'm going to jump ahead to another part that I can't read that well. Anyhow, that's, that's as far as I can go. It's like totally illegible. <laughs> yeah, but you found yourself at the only black tennis club in America. That's, yeah, I think it's the second one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is implicitly compelling. I mean, just to me as a reader, I mean, you know, had you ever written about that no. tennis club? No. How old are you? Oh my God, I couldn't have been more than 13. No, how old are you now? Oh, how old am I? I'm 70. You are 70 years old and you've never written about this tennis club. And what year was this all black tennis club you're thinking of when you wrote? You're making me do math, Deanna. Um, it was a long time ago. It was probably yeah. 64, 64, That is a, That is a very compelling, and then you also you have this father-son relationship. I mean, there's a lot going on here in this. You know, this is one of the reasons why we exploit randomness um, or why I do it, you know, when I think up assignments, um, I want to send the message to people that there's no magical thing that happens with some prompt that the teacher thinks up, because I can do that as well. I'm kind of an assignment machine. I, I want people to see that actually um, you could do this too. You could, you could exploit randomness, you know, in your practice. And it's the kind of thing that happens all the time. 
you know, um, in the spiritual life or in just ordinary life. You just never know what's going to happen. And then the world comes at you like a sideways ugly machine, um, you know, and suddenly you, you, you get page um, 31 and suddenly Angelo takes us to the only black tennis or one of two black tennis clubs in all of America. And, you know, the past comes just right up. Often the past offers itself uh, far more readily through randomness than through any kind of an agenda or any kind of attention. You know, let's say Angela sat down to write uh, an essay about race, you know, going back to his question from before, and he had a lots, lots of smart things that he planned to say and maybe even a structure in mind. And then in the middle of it all, well, what about that tennis club? And what about my father? And what about that? And suddenly you find you're at the heart of something and you didn't even suspect you needed to go there. You know, this is the kinds of surprises that happen, you know, when, when you have an approach to writing that's as spiritual as anyone's approach to, um, you know, a practice, uh, the invisible world. Uh, compassion, you know, whatever that takes out of you, it should be a surprise. I'll, I'll read you what I wrote for this. We were raised to be proud of the lawn. The problem was we had a terrible lawn. Next door, the Gomeses had a fine lawn, sheer, green, rich, and thick, all on account of indoor or underground sprinklers that popped up dutifully at dawn and sprayed a dewy sheen over the gorgeous sod pitch that sat like an emerald field before the Gomez's house, also due to Craig, their cousin with the landscaping business who manicured the grounds each week with the help of a dozen machines, mowers and blowers and trimmers and spreaders. Craig had a beard and long hair and looked like Walt Whitman. He was a plant. His pores were caked in a patina of dirt. He loved what he did. He charged a fortune. The Gomeses could afford it. And so they had a lawn they could be proud of. So I went for the concrete. I tend to trust, you know, things like spreaders and, you know, emeralds and dirt and, you know, these kinds of concrete things. Um, but then we have this abstraction like, like pride and, and, and what have you. Um, so, uh, it doesn't matter where you begin as long as you're willing to switch into what this other thing is. Um, and maybe the last thing uh, I'll just say, <clears throat> and this is, this is just kind of high art, but I think it's also how life goes as well. There's a doctrine from Richard Hugo called the two subjects. I've already mentioned part of it. He says, there's always with any piece of writing an initiating subject the subject that causes the writing to happen, the subject you sit down with, or the subject I gave you for, we were, we were raised to be proud of, is an initiating subject. And what Richard Hugo says is you're looking for the second subject. And the second subject can only be found in the act of writing. And you cannot know it. By definition, you can't know it. Just like the golden thread, only the golden thread knows where it's going. And that second subject, I mean, it's kind of mystical. I always think it's a deeper you, it's a deeper me, that second subject, but I can't know it. That's how deep it is. Um, and art itself is the leap we make from the initiating subject to the second subject. The two are never the same. And that leap is art. But it's also life. It's also the great moments when um, things go right and things go wrong or whatever. You know, the, the, something about the moment makes a leap and you realize, wait a minute, I'm in this completely other place. It was here all along, but I didn't suspect it or, or, or what have you. Um, so, so there's just a little visit to what we talk about when I talk about uh, writing, um, the course I teach is weekly. Um, 
and if anyone wants to join anytime they want, they are quite welcome. It's called Actually Writing, and um, in fact, here's a link in the chat to it. Um, we, we just charge people 20 bucks for a writing class if they want to come and join us. And what I do is um, every week I show people a different protocol for getting down the page. Um, so the subject for uh, December 3rd, we're taking Thanksgiving off. Uh, Thursday, December 3rd, we're doing something called working your subject. I'm going to introduce what that is, what it would mean to work our subject. And, um, and then the next week will be something else and something else and something else. And I do this for 20 weeks and anyone can join for the whole thing or come anytime they want. And there's really no obligation to, except to yourself, uh, if you want to write. But it, it's fun to just, you know, come here on a, a Saturday morning um, to this other realm and talk about spirituality in the same breath as writing. Um, could we maybe open up to just a Q&A at this point? Um, because we've kind of looked at a lot of things here together. What's, what's, what's coming up for people at this point? Anything you're, you're particularly interested in? It's not so much a question, Diana. It was just sort of a statement. So, I mean, I couldn't read my handwriting, but that's, that's been true for a long time. But um, I learned so – it was very interesting because I, I – aspects about myself I didn't – I had not – I was not in touch with. Where did you go? There you are. You went to the right – Part of my screen. I'm yeah. tricky. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I mean, I went from um, competition with with my dad, um, to I went to um, just the difficulty of learning how to play tennis, and uh, enjoying it, and then trying to refine it. So it's very interesting. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. It's like very rich. Uh, and I don't know if there's anything else that can do it quite like writing in terms of um, harvesting the past in a certain sense. Yeah. Well, you know, I think maybe nothing can do it quite like that for you. I mean, yeah. but you know that the whole notion of, for example, when I describe sitting down to the cushion, you know, trying to sit with one problem and then discovering, wait a minute, that's not the problem. It's a different problem. That's the same thing as the second subject, you know, and the way it happens is not by plan. You sit, you settle, you open to the space and you see what comes up, you know, um, but I definitely relate to it as, you know, as a writer, it's the only thing I do trust. Um, I can tell a dead poem from a mile away. Someone who got exactly what they expected, everything in the poem, you know, I, I look at every single thing and it might be fantastic. The only thing bad about it is the entire thing because it's dead. This person was not in the interrogative mode. They didn't take a stance that was neutral. They had a plan and they prosecuted it, and that was the problem. I mean, it's why I started teaching this way, actually, because I got—I I was sick. Most people teach writing uh, at the revision stage. Everyone brings in the thing they already wrote, and I say, "Well, back that truck up. How did that thing get written?" Because yeah, most of the, pe the people bringing me these dead poems, and it just doesn't feel good to tell someone their dead poem is dead. That's just that's not enjoyable for anyone, um, and, but yet you can't lie to them. Well, let's, why don't we just write some new thing and it doesn't matter if it's dead because we could just turn the page and write another thing. How much happier is that? Diana, can you say something about how to stay present when you're writing? I'm finding that I get distracted by things um, I guess it's the ego that's just getting in my way as I'm writing and I'm thinking, right. is this okay? Yeah. Uh, switch lanes. Ah. Switch lanes. Um, you know, in sports, in football, they have what's called a quarterback clock. Um, people who are football fans may know this, but basically what happens is you've got this clever guy called the quarterback who's got to throw the ball. And he's got about 2.4 seconds to release that ball downfield before about four or five guys who are paid millions of dollars to murder him, murder him. And so what he has is a clock in his head. He can't see half these people because if he's right-handed and they're coming from the left side, he's not going to see them. It's blindside. So 
because he can't see them, what he has is a clock. He says, okay, I'm about to be murdered. I, I can trust this. It's been about 2.4 seconds. <laughs> so it's time to pass the damn ball or to, to scramble or to throw it out of bounds. Now, good writers also have a quarterback clock. They have this instinct that what they're doing right now, you know, whatever it is, the one thing they're doing, it's about to go stale. It's about to die. So they switch, you know, and so they loosen up the tether or that, you know, they take it somewhere else. And this is one of the techniques. There's a lot of techniques like this where we, we just switch. We shade into a different emotion. We, um, we go into dialogue if we're describing. We go into de description if we're doing dialogue. Um, we, um, we, you know, there's all kinds of ways to switch and all kinds of moves we make. And we do this not to be a virtuoso, not to be fancy, not to show off, you know, hey, ma, no hands. We do this because uh, it keeps the page alive. And it also mirrors the texture of reality itself. Reality itself is always switching. The wind is always switching direction. The weather is always changing. And so, you know, nothing more creative than reality. And so we should be a little like that on the page. Um, you know, if, if, we, if we wrote three sentences in a fantastic way, good, now switch. Keep it fresh before it goes stale. What Richard Hugo says about the second subject, he gives this example about somebody writing about autumn leaves. He says, you know, let's say you plan to write about autumn leaves. Okay, well, that's fantastic. Let's start writing about autumn leaves. And then suddenly it goes stale. You, you start repeating what you already said about autumn leaves. You start telling the reader how you feel, which you already said too. And, uh, and what do you do? Well, you switch. You switch to the other subject, the second subject. In fact, you should switch before you run out of things to say about autumn leaves, because the piece is never about autumn leaves. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, you know, it could be any number of reasons why you would get tired as well. Um, so, you know, what, what good writers have is as big a toolkit as possible, you know, as many moves as possible. And again, it's like an athlete having many ways to escape, you know, the pocket, you know, many ways, many options. You know, maybe a rookie quarterback can only do one or two things, only has a few plays to memorize. But then the more experienced quarterback uh, has many more moves, very crafty. You know, just try to, try to sack Tom Brady. It's very hard to do because the guy's got moves. He's got game. That's what writers do. They build their game. Uh, same, same deal though with meditation. Uh, good meditators will know hundreds of energy practices. You know, you sit down and you're stale. Okay, fine. That's, that shouldn't be a problem. Now, what do you do with it? How do you work with it? You know, in the Tibetan system, there's all kinds of things you can do. As it's my tradition, you know, you can, um, you can uh, do what's called pacifying. I've already mentioned close placement. You could do energy practice. You could do tantric practice. You can do um, chakra-based practice. You could um, do nundro practice. You could do all kinds of, there's all kinds of things you, you can do. Um, and, then, and then it becomes a matter of, okay, which tool? You know, I mean, in, in Tibetan system, it's like, which karma? There's four karmas that stop karma. Which one? Which is the right one? And you don't want it to be your default. You want it to be the right tool for the situation, which means that you want to get as many tools as possible so that you might have the right one, like a good car mechanic, you know? So I don't know what will pop you out of that stale place. Maybe you'll find one tool or two and then start to accumulate more and more ways to, to keep things fresh as you go down the page. It's, it's a very beautiful practice. And um, I think with writing, there's a tremendous transfer power to the rest of your life. If you can start um, you know, surprising yourself on the page, if you could start making um, more interesting decisions on the page, you start to become bored with yourself and more interested in other things, um, that transfers over to your life. I mean, that freshens up a lot of things. 
I always say when I teach children, you know, when, when kids can make good moves on the page, they can make really good moves in their lives. I've yapped. <laughs> any, any other questions or comments? Anything else coming up for people? So uh, would anyone like some homework? Sure. Okay, so here's some homework. Um, take yourself on three writing dates this week. By dates, what I mean is you're gonna sit with your calendar and you're gonna decide in advance three times on three days that you're going to write. And the reason you're doing this is so that you can keep your dates keep your appointments um and it could it need only be five minutes because a free write doesn't take very long but you're going to do three times three days this week and um you're going to exploit randomness you're going to give yourself an assignment in the way i just did with with you you could take a book and choose page 31 and one of these free writes will involve a word that you'll choose some subject, some word, preferably a concrete noun for this group, because y'all are spiritual, so it's all abstract, so stay concrete. Get a good word, like pajamas. There's a good word. Can you think of a better word than pajamas? Because I can't. So, you, you, so the first thing will be a subject that's just a word. On another day, your subject will be a first line, just like we did. And the third day, the subject will be a random page and you read the whole page. You have no idea what's gonna jump out at you, but by the time you're done with that page, something will occur to you and you'll just write. You, you won't be writing a commentary on the page, you'll just be writing something as a result of having read that page. This is three writing dates, three free writes, write continuously, and then three random subjects. And you just see what happens. So, uh, so, I, so that, that's what I have for you today. <laughs> uh, Dan, I just want to thank you, I guess, on behalf of all of us for just a, just a very rich um, session to hopefully um, open all of our um, eyes to how, to how to write better and just how to enjoy it. Thank you so much for being our guest. Actually writing. Uh, it's in the chat. I'll send it to all of you so you have a link to it. Some more, Diana.